The Himalayas formed several million years ago when two tectonic plates collided. Why is this dramatic area considered so potentially dangerous today? The same forces that lead to earthquakes also make mountains. Around 45 million years ago, the Asian and Indian tectonic plates collided with incredible force. Neither would give way, so the land began to move up. What started at sea level is now the Himalayas, standing more than eight kilometers high. This is the highest mountain range in the world, and it's still growing. As it does, enormous stresses are building that must eventually be released. Nearly 100 million people live around the Himalayas in a danger zone. In the last century alone, earthquakes here claim the lives of more than 30,000 people. The area has been quiet for years, but scientists think that another big quake could happen in the near future. Rebecca Bendick from the University of Colorado is one scientist keeping track of the situation. Global positioning satellites send her information that could provide an early warning. She's learning how the plates converge or push together to create stresses within the land. The crux of the matter is that we need to know how that total convergence is partitioned over the fault. If all 60 millimeters of convergence has to be accommodated in one place, on one fault, on this one narrow line, then the earthquakes we have there are going to be big and they're going to happen often. But if instead all of that strain is accommodated on several different faults, something like an accordion, then each fault can only be expected to fail less frequently and less violently. Rebecca Bendick and her colleagues also monitor an area in the foothills that is rising at an even faster rate. Signs of this uplift are found in the rivers that spill through the valleys. In some places, the land rises faster than the river can erode it, creating giant steps and treacherous whitewater rapids. Bendick takes a ride through these rapids to see how the area is changing. Those steeper places are corresponding to places where the uplift is, is quick, so quick that the river can't keep up. Um, this will give us clues about places to come back and do more intensive GPS research to try to pin down the uplift rate. Conducting research like this is both exhilarating and dangerous. But in an earthquake zone inhabited by people, the information is vital. So we're going to talk about mountain building today. And uh, what you see in front of you there is a photo of myself in the middle there, my wife on the left, and our good buddy Ashish on the right over there goofing around in the southern Alps of New Zealand. So those mountains that are in the background, one of which we're on top of, uh, that's a collisional plate boundary where two plates have collided and thrust up uh, the Earth's lithosphere and exposed a bunch of rock and made this huge mountain range here. So we're gonna talk a little bit about sort of how rock, rock deforms and the types of stresses that are on it uh, and the different features that you get uh, when those stresses are at play. So let's dive in here. First off, uh, the main factors that, are, that affect deformation. Deformation just means like to deform something, to change its shape. Um, so the big things here, of course, are the, the strength of the rock itself. Like how strong is the rock is going to have a, a lot to say about whether it deforms uh, easily or difficult or whether it just fractures, it actually cracks. Um, other factors will include things like temperature, um, the confining pressure, how much pressure is on the rock to begin with even before we start uh, adding additional pressures to it, the, the type of rock and especially the time, how long uh, are the forces at work. Um, because you can have a fairly small force at work for 
a long amount of time and cause quite a bit of deformation. Or you could have a pretty small force at work for a short amount of time that doesn't do anything at all. Um, so uh, anyways, uh, some definitions here just to get us started. Like I said, deformation just means the deforming or the changing of the size, the shape of a body of rock. Uh, it's hard to imagine, but something as solid and as, as seemingly brittle as rock uh, and, and tough as rock can actually be bent and twisted and changed shape without ever even melting the stuff. Um, it just requires the right amount of pressure for the right amount of time. Uh, now, most of the deformation of the Earth's crust happens along plate boundaries. So wherever there's an oceanic plate meeting another oceanic plate or a continental uh, piece of crust meeting an oceanic crustal piece, uh, where those things are colliding, that's where most of the deforming happens. Because where things are pulling apart, there's, um, there's a different types of stress. So the words stress and strain here, stress is just the force per unit area acting on the rock. Okay? It's, so it's a measurable thing. It's how much force is actually being put on the rock itself. Strain is the actual change in shape of the rock. That that's the result of the stress. So a rock gets strained, uh, causing its change of shape because of stresses that are working on it. Okay, so that should make sense, hopefully. Uh, let's move on to some of the big factors here that we already mentioned, uh, temperature and pressure. So there's, there's two ways that rocks permanently change shape or deform. Uh, they're known as brittle deformation and ductile deformation. And the two words are pretty self-explanatory. Brittle things, when they brittly deform, they crack and fracture. So rather than like a nice bend or a nice change in shape, they actually crack and, and shift. So that's known as fracturing. Most of the time when you're thinking about earthquakes and things like that, you're probably mentally, you're thinking about a fracture, a big shifting, a big crack of the earth. Right? That would be the fault itself. Uh, ductile deformation is when, you, when the rock sort of flows and changes shape, uh, almost like you would expect something like silly putty would change shape if you put some force on it. Uh, so uh, it's a change in the size and shape of it without actually cracking the rock itself. Okay, rock types. Uh, rock type, of course, does have a big effect on this, and I mentioned this earlier, but the types of minerals that the rock is made up of, um, and even the texture of the rock itself, will affect how it's going to deform. Is it going to fracture, or is it going to more ductilely deform? Is it going to do that easily? Is it going to be difficult? We already mentioned the factor of time here, and like I said, time has to do with how long the force is acting on that rock. So in even a small force acting over a rock for a long period of time could deform it, right? Now let's talk some types of stress. There are three main types of stresses that rocks undergo. And they are tensional stress, compressional stress, and shear stress. The, the three types are different, but there are three types of stresses. So when you're answering that question on your quiz, make sure you select all three of those types of stress. Uh, I'm going to show you a picture of this here in a second, but let me just briefly describe it, and then the picture will hopefully make like really clear sense to you. So a tensional stress is what's experienced when you pull things apart. So if you're pulling from both sides, you're creating tension on, on the object. Okay. Uh, compressional stress is when you push the objects together. So you're, comp you're creating stress by compressing it. You're pushing from both sides. Shear stress is when you slide things beside each other. So one thing slides one direction, the other slides the other direction, and there's stresses between the two where the friction builds up as it slides past. So you can almost think of like scissors that we sometimes refer to scissors as shears. So they're shearing, one side of the scissor is passing beside the other side, and that's what actually cuts your paper. Let's look at a picture here. In this diagram, you can see the unstressed block is just a block. If we apply tensional stress to it, it thins in the middle and pulls apart. 
So you can imagine what's going to happen to something if you apply tensional stress to it. Eventually, you're probably going to fault it and crack it and pull it apart, right? This is the type of stress that's happening at the mid-oceanic ridges. They're pulling apart. Sometimes we have a rifting valley, like in Africa, where the two plates are pulling apart, and there's big valleys forming in between, and mountains on either side. Then we have compressional stress. This is what happens where we push two things together, and you can see that it bulges up there in the top, and it pushes out towards the bottom, too. This is typical mountain building, like I showed you there with the Southern Alps in New Zealand. You've got two plates pushing together, so the compression of that forces material upwards and downwards. And then finally, we have a picture of shear stress there. And I realize it's just a single block we're talking about, so we're kind of pushing it one direction on top there and the other direction on the bottom. So that shifting there is shearing it. Okay. So let's turn now to some folding. Uh, what types of features might we see from these different types of stresses? Uh, well, folds are a very common feature. Uh, oftentimes of compressional stresses, sometimes of shear stresses. And we've got some names here. We have anticlines, synclines, and monoclines. So uh, let me describe them for you, then I'm going to show you another diagram that will make hopefully a lot of sense. So anticlines are, um, actually let me tell you about synclines first. A syncline, you can think of it sort of as sinking, that's an easy way to remember it because the strata, the rock layers, bend downwards. Okay, so picture it like this. Uh, lake Superior, humongous lake, uh, largest of the Great Lakes. It's really heavy. There's a big dent in the ground there because it formed from an ancient ice sheet that literally pushed the earth downwards. So all of the rock anywhere around in nearby Lake Superior dips. It kind of points downwards towards the lake itself. And that's known as the Lake Superior Syncline. It's kind of a famous uh, area in the United States. So a syncline is kind of like a basin. It's, it's this dip where the rock layers dip downwards. Okay, They sink, if you will. An anticline is the opposite of that. It's anti what a syncline is. You can also think of it like an A, because these things fold upwards like you would draw an A from the bottom up, like an arch like that. So these things form these arching A-like folds where the rock layers point upwards. Okay, uh, And then lastly, uh, we have monoclines. And monoclines on the Earth's surface tend to look like steps uh, if you're looking at them where they've been eroded away. Uh, but you've got this horizontal uh, sedimentary strata, horizontal layers of rock, uh, and these things fold form these sort of folded, uh, step-like sort of structures. And I'll show you a picture uh, that will make a little bit more sense. Okay, let's look at the photo here. So an anticline and a syncline are typically formed together. If you've got compressional stresses from either side, so, so you can think of forces pushing uh, from the right side of the picture there inwards and from the left side of the picture inwards, you're going to crinkle this up almost like an accordion, right? So where the crinkles bunch up and point upwards, you have an anticline, and where the crinkles kind of fold downwards, you have a syncline. So typically what you see is anticline, syncline, anticline, syncline, anticline, syncline, so on and so forth. Uh, and in places where the anticlines get smeared totally over top of themselves, uh, we actually refer to that as an overturned limb. So you can almost completely smear the rock layers over top of each other. You can get some really weird shapes. Now on the surface, if you look at that, uh, you, you don't necessarily see the layers like you do in cross-section like that. You see like a, a ridge of mountains, uh, then kind of this little valley-ish sort of, sort of flat area, then another ridge of mountains, and this sort of valley-ish sort of flat area. And it kind of repeats like that uh, if, you, if you actually see it uh, on the surface. Let's look at a monocline. So a monocline might form uh, in an area where you've got a fault, like in the diagram below. So the rock actually cracked and shifted, but the layers over top of it, they didn't crack through. The fault didn't pass through those. So those layers were actually able to bend and shift uh, with that fault. And so they kind of, it's like this large flat expanse, and then it kind of drops down like a step. Now on Earth's surface, when you're looking at those, because of the way erosion happens, 
they look like all of these weird folded steps going downwards. So that's what a monocline is. Okay, let's talk about some different types of faults that form. So uh, a fault is, is a literal crack in earth. Right? It's a fault is what happens with earthquakes. They're shifting along a fault line. We've already talked about those some. But there's different types of faults. Uh, the, the four main ones are normal faults, reverse faults, thrust faults, and then something called a stripe slip fault, which I'll show you here in a second. So uh, normal and reverse basically just refer to which way the rock shifts. Okay, and I'll show you a fo a, a, an image of this. It'll, it'll make a little bit more sense. But a normal fault, all that is, is when the, the hanging wall block, and there's a hanging and a foot wall, which I'll show you here in a second, when the hanging wall shifts uh, downwards relative to what's known as the foot wall. Now, those get their names, oddly enough, because uh, miners, when they would find these faults, um, when they were underground, they could see the crack in the rock, and so the foot wall was, was what they referred to as the part you could kind of stand on, and the part that hung out over it was the hanging wall. So that's where those weird words sort of come from. Uh, it will make more sense when you see the diagram, though. A reverse fault or a thrust fault, uh, those are just the opposite of that. So instead of the hanging wall block moving down, the hanging wall block moves up. It slides up over top of the foot wall block. And a thrust fault is the exact same thing as a reverse fault. It's just that it really smears out because there's this kind of elongated 45 degree, um, less than 45 degree angle that it shifts out over. It, like the, the, um, the hanging wall block thrusts itself really far over, over the foot wall block. And so uh, it, it, looks, it looks different, but it's the same type of movement. Okay, strike-slip faults. Strike-slip faults are faults where the movement along the fault is parallel or horizontal to the fault, sur fault surface itself, to the actual crack, the fault. So these are the types of faults that you think of when you think of San Andreas, where there's one type of a block sliding past another block um, in, in sort of a horizontal stress sort of a situation. Um, so there's not like a hanging wall and a foot wall. You can think of two uh, rock bodies right beside each other sliding past each other, parallel to each other. And then the final word here is called a joint. A joint is just uh, a fracture where there's no real big movement. So you can imagine any time there's faulting going on, there's going to be a lot of cracks, right? So our word for that is called a joint. And we can see those all over the place wherever there is faulting occurring. Here are what some joints look like when you're on Earth's surface. Joints, when they're eroded away, can be all these like little cracks like this. Let's look at a photo here that will, or a diagram at least, that will show you what those different faults are. So going left to right and down, let's start with the normal fault up there. A normal fault is the result of something known as tensional stress, which we already discussed. So tensional stress is when you're pulling the blocks apart, right? So if you pull these apart, you can see that the hanging wall, the rock, the wall that sticks up and hangs out like that, actually slides down the foot wall. See what I was talking about there? The little arrows show you which way it's moving. So if you pull those apart, the white arrows, those little black arrows are showing you which way that hanging wall is going to fall down. Okay. A reverse fault is the reverse of that, and it happens when you compress it. So if you push those two sides together, what's going to happen is that hanging wall is going to slide up and push up above the foot wall. If you're wondering which way it moved, just look at the layers there and look at how the layers change uh, relationship to each other. Now the thrust fault in the bottom left there is exactly the same thing as a reverse fault, only it's more extreme. So you've got these crazy uh, compressional forces here, and it doesn't just slide up, it slides over it and slides on top of it. You can see what's going on there with the hanging wall is like totally over top of the foot wall. But it's the same type of stresses. It's compressional. And then finally, the strike slip fault, like I mentioned before, uh, these are the types of faults like you'd see in the San Andreas Fault over in California. It's a shearing stress. So rather than scissors that go like top to bottom on top of each other, these things slide past each other. So it's still a shearing type of motion, 
and you can see how one of those blocks could get caught on the other one and stick. And if that friction builds up and builds up and builds up, pow, you get a big, huge earthquake, right? So that's a shear type, uh, type of a faulting situation, shear type of stresses. So you should be able to answer that last question there. Um, go ahead and submit your quiz. That's it for today.